but I agree with every word. <laughs> I'm sorry I do not speak Polish, but I will try to speak slowly so you will understand. Um, I have 38 years of passion for Bob Marley and reggae music. And to put all of that into two hours is impossible, but I will try. And over the years, I have been collecting everything I could find about Bob and reggae and Rasta and all the things that a study of job music leads you to. And I have had much help over all the years from people like my dear old friend Wojtek here, who is the godfather of, of reggae music, I think, in Poland. And I'm so happy to see you here today. Um, my love for the music started in 1973 when I read an article in Rolling Stone magazine. And the writer said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire <coughs> amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. <laughs> and I said, I have no idea what that means, but I gotta find it right away. And I went out that day and bought Bob Marley's first international album, Catch a Fire. And the next day I saw The Harder They Come, the great Jamaican movie, and bought the soundtrack on the way home. And my life literally changed forever from those moments, as I know for some of the people here tonight, when you hear Bob Marley, your life changes. And I was lucky enough to travel with him for two weeks on his last American tour in 1979. <coughs> and what I am going to show you is unreleased films some of them date back almost 40 years. So this is not high definition, this is not MTV, this is home movies in some cases. But the content of the film, I think, will make up for the, the lack of you know, perfection in the images. Um, I would like to begin with a quick run through Bob's life using some unreleased music, a cappella versions, an alternate version of One Love, where Bob sings, I'm black, I'm black, I'm black, I'm black. And also Bunny Whaler screaming like a vampire. Because he, Peter said, if him black, show me how him black. And if him well, show me one thing that is well with him, him Chris Whitehurst. <laughs> So, uh, my wife Mary is on the controls. We are in good hands. And, uh, <laughs> Something about you, about okay. yourself, about... Introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Well, my name is Roger Steffens, and uh, I have been involved in reggae music on almost every level for about 35 years actually 38 years since I first heard reggae in 1973. And I made my living most of my life as an actor and a voiceover artist. I narrated a film that won an Oscar. I read Bill Gates' book on tape recently. <laughs> I'm the voice of Bill Gates, if you can imagine that. And um, I do a lot of photography work and Whenever, uh, whenever a subject interests me, I keep a file on it because I think someday I might write something about it or maybe speak about it. And in 1973, when I read an article in Rolling Stone about reggae, I saw the word for the first time ever, and I cut the article out and put it in a little manila folder. And I look back now after 38 years and I realize that was the beginning of Roger Steffen's reggae archives. Uh, Timothy White called them that. Uh, I didn't even realize that all that stuff in the basement was an archive. And uh, if, you, if you collect enough stuff after a while, the pile of junk in the basement becomes an archive. And we've had to move house twice to house the archive. 
and now it fills six rooms, floor to ceiling, and it's almost full again. It's it's incredible. And wherever I go, you know, people are so generous. You know, today I got a, a mint copy of a beautiful Solidarity poster, reggae poster, from uh, my friend uh, Matty Dredd. And uh, people gave me music today from Poland, and I'll take that back to America and play it on the radio in America. And I'll play it in other countries as I travel as well. I'm always looking for really interesting international reggae because I think it's the world outside of Jamaica that is the healthiest for reggae these days. It's the local interpretations of the basic reggae rhythms with local concerns. I'm sure a lot of Polish reggae is about what's going on in your own country. And reggae is the chosen rhythm of resistance around the world. Uh, a professor from the University of the West Indies told me in the 1980s she went to Nicaragua and the Contras and the Sandinistas were both going to battle listening to Bob Marley records. <laughs> and he, he seems to be the universal figure in music whose work is destined because his music longer stands for something. It means something. It gives people hope. It speaks of love and forgiveness, but also of equal rights and justice. And the reggae musicians are the people who brought that stance to the rest of the world, and the rest of the world has heeded that message. And as I said today, we are now all part of Bob Marley's movement of job people. I look around and I see young people like, like the four of you sitting here with me right now, and it gives me hope that the future will, will be better. And we need hope more than ever before in the world right now, because the world is in a desperately troubled and dangerous state right now. And uh, as long as there are young people like you listening to the music of Bob Marley, I think we're going to be okay. And there are voices uh, that uh, reggae is like the Jamaican culture, mm. the Jamaican music, but uh, so we can hear you think it's like a worldwide oh, message. Absolutely. Yeah. In 1979, Bob Marley played in Cleveland, Ohio. And a reporter said, how would you feel if you came back here next year and the audience was filled with white people with dreadlocks? And Bob Marley said, great, man. We feel great. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, you know, wherever I go in the world, the, the, the audiences are filled with white people, all kinds of colored people, young people with dreadlocks. Yes. Mm. I know your presentation really moved me. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, it, it was great for me to see this. I am really satisfied with and I really liked it. Uh, and why do you think it's important to, to do it, to, to show it to people? Why do you think it's important? Because you are so in it, you <laughs> have a passion, you, you I don't know how to say it, but you have an energy which goes to people, you know. And uh, do you think uh, this kind of uh, presentation can change something? Can well, I hope it corrects some, uh, some mistakes that are out there, the stories that are told about Bob that aren't true. And I try to always explain why I say what I say or who said it to me, because it's the people who lived with Bob Marley and worked with him who know the true story not the Timothy Whites of the world who were you know, at a great remove. And I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I have been given a, a, an enormous blessing in my life. Uh, knowing about reggae music, yes. seeing it in Jamaica. Uh, the, the show that you saw today uh, began when someone asked me to show my unreleased films at the uh, American Film Institute at their National Video Festival. And I said, all right, I can do that. But that turned into a, a show. And that show now I've done over 400 times over the past 27 years in some of the strangest places you can imagine. As I said, from the bottom of the Grand Canyon with the Supai Indians, you know, and, and the Maori. When we did the show in New Zealand, a woman came her entire face was tattooed 
was like Spider Woman. And she sat right in front of me. I mean, it just it, it gave me the creeps, <laughs> to tell you the truth. It was so strange. But she regarded Bob Marley as a prophet. You know? and, and wherever you go, you find people, especially native peoples, what the Canadians call First Nations, uh, respond more strongly to Bob and his message than anyone else. Because Bob was a man of the earth, a man of the soil. If you asked Bob who he was, he said, I'm a farmer. Right to the end, I'm a farmer. He understood the rhythm of nature. He worked in the fields from the time he was three years old. And so people who live in the natural balance and rhythm of the earth respond so strongly to Bob Marley's music. He be he's one of them. They know, they know that this is someone who understands that basic, natural way of living and was able to reach people from the highest levels of government on down to you and me and maintain his humility and his the strength of his beliefs. And I think that message is worth repeating over and over again so that young people like yourselves will have a contact with someone who was part of that scene when it was happening. You know, when, when I meet somebody who, you know, I wear my Bob Riley shirts all the time, and of course, when I see somebody kind of looking, you know, I go, oh, you like Bob Riley? Yes. You know, I say, shake the hand that shook the hand of Bob Marley. So now that person is just one person between Bob Marley and themselves, you know. And my wife is always mad at me which, when I do that, but I think it might mean something to, you know, a young person who loves Bob Marley. Does your family also love uh, Bob oh, yeah. Marley? Yes, they do. better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my daughter is a disc jockey and she plays Bob Marley in her sound system. It's all vinyl. And uh, my son is a musician. I mean, it for a long, his middle name is Marley. Or as he said for many years, my name is Devin, don't call me Marley. So <laughs> is it for the kids. <laughs> and he's, he's about six foot three. And until he lost his hair, he had bright blonde hair. And his latest single is called, I Am the Black Prophet. <laughs> so he's got a good sense of humor. But he's more into electronic music than, than reggae. But when I'm not home, I find that he has my records out. He's kind of, he just doesn't want me to know. And do you listen to other kind of music? Oh, absolutely. I loved. I was raised on doo wop in the fifties. I saw Buddy Holly in person, and you know all the great rock and roll originators: Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, Frankie Lyman, all all of these people in in 1957, 58. And I loved the harmonies of doo wop. And then in the 60s, of course, Dylan, the conscious artist. And by 1970, the major corporations had bought the record companies and they took away that consciousness and turned it into crap. And I was looking in the early 70s for something to reignite my interest in music. And when I heard reggae, I heard the harmonies of doo-wop that the Jamaicans grew up listening to also, but with the consciousness and the Rastafarian spirituality added to that. And I said, wow, I can't believe that there was a place right off the coast of America producing such a rich culture and I never heard any of it before. I couldn't believe it. So uh, from 1973 forward, my whole life has been an attempt to find out as much as I possibly can about Bob and reggae and Rasta and all the things that a study of reggae music leads you into. And I'm still learning all the time. I mean, that stuff I talked about today with Dr. Issels. I met a woman at a party about five weeks ago who knew Issels' widow. She's still alive. She's 91 years of age. And when I go home, I'm going to do a video interview with her. I mean, that was, what a blessing, you know? And, and, you know, I always thought that Issels was just a Nazi and what a bad character this guy was. But the Nazis put him in a concentration camp because he wouldn't treat, they didn't want him to treat Jewish people. So that makes me think in a very different way about Dr. Issus after all, all these years. So I'm open all the time to learning new things. And my story of the Smile Jamaica concert today was different from the way I've ever told it before because last week at Reggae Sunska in Bordeaux, I met the man who produced the concert. The man whose idea it was, the man who thought of the name. 
and then asked Bob to headline it and write a song by that name. So it's a very different telling of that story from all the other tales I heard from other people who didn't know the full truth. So, you know, it keeps me humble because I don't know everything. I'll tell you the story. Um, I was talking to a young man named Bolly Reed, and when Neville Garrick, the art director of Tough Gone, retired, uh, uh, Bolly became the new art director in the mid 80s. And we were talking one day about maybe about 10 years ago. And uh, we were talking about, after Bob died, how the slackness came into the movie, Yellow Man, and all this filthy language, and hating women, and hating gay people, and all the stuff that never happened when Bob was alive. And I said, and, and Bob could write a, a bawdy song without making you feel dirty listening to it. And he says, like what? And I said, I don't know. Uh, kinky reggae. He said, what line? I said, well, how about she had brown sugar all over her bogolova? And he said, that's not what that means. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, in Jamaica, when they cut down the cane fields, all that's left of the plant is this dark brown root. And the people who work in the cane fields wear these cheap canvas shoes called bogus. So if you see a girl in Kingston with brown sugar all over her booga wooga, you know she's a cane field worker in from the country. So about a year after I learned that, I went to Kingston to do my show there for the first time. Uh, and, and Mary said it's the only time she's ever seen me nervous on stage. I mean, in the front row was Mortimer Planner, uh, Muta Baruka, Uju Banton, Third World, the Mighty Diamonds, people from the Marley Museum, and I'm telling them about Marley. You know. And so I started the show and I said, I want to do the show here tonight the way I do it overseas. And I beg you, if I say anything that is not accurate, please come up afterwards and tell me, because I want this to be the way Jamaicans understand this story. So I did the show, and afterwards, um, Dr. Clinton Hutton from the Reggae Studies Department came backstage and he says, you know that story you told about the Booga Woogas? I said, yeah. He says, don't change a word. <laughs> <laughs> One more story, more... Marta. Needs to... Needs you. Needs, needs me. To get going. Okay. Oh. It's about it's about I'll make it a long story. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, tell your favorite story. So this mm. be the last one. Tell your favorite oh, story. I, I have so many different stories. I don't know. I told a lot of them today. Um, hmm. okay. That's a hard one. I have to have a subject in mind. Bob Marley's music. Nobody. Nobody. Um, it's just as the reporter from the New York Times wrote in 1996. I still agree with that. And it's truer now than, it, than it's ever been. Uh, and if you want, I can repeat that quote for you. Uh, in 1996, the New York Times Sunday Magazine celebrated its 100th anniversary. And they asked their critics to choose a work of art in their fields that would survive 100 years in the future. And John Pirelli's P-A-R-E-L-E-S, the chief music critic for the New York Times, wrote these words. Bob Marley became the voice of third world pain and resistance, the sufferer in the concrete jungle who would not be denied forever. Outsiders everywhere heard his voice as their own. If he could make himself heard, so could they without compromise. In 2096, when the former third world has overrun and colonized the former superpowers, Bob Marley will be commemorated as a saint. Okay. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you. My music will go on forever, yeah? Maybe a fool will say that, but I know it will go on forever. A lot of energy was expended. It's time to rest. Yes. I'll rest when I'm dead. <laughs>